know that, you know, the nice thing is that we're all at home and I'm kind of uh, unfortunate thing is I keep on getting little notifications. My apologies. Um, so we are going to get started and I lost my train of thought and that's fine. So we're going to get started. I'm real quick. <laughs> I forgot to start the recording. So for those of you who are going to watch this recording, we're going to start with making the wrappers first because they have to rest. And here we go. And here we go. So what I have first is we're going to get a large mixing bowl. Um, but we're going to start with, of course, if you are not making your own wrappers, you can just take a sip of whatever drink you got and watch. <laughs> but we're going to start with making our own wrappers. So I have a cup and a half of bread flour and a cup, of cup and a half of all-purpose flour. That's in a separate bowl. And then the recipe says about a cup of water, of hot water. So in our large bowl, we're going to put a cup of water, the hot water. Just about there. Um, I like to have a little bit extra on the side because depending on where you're at, um, especially in Colorado, you guys are pretty dry and high in altitude, so you may need to add a little bit more water to keep your dough nice and moist. Portland, or even on the west coast, or if you're in a more humid city, we don't got to worry about that as much. Um, and then we're going to add a teaspoon of salt to our hot water and let that dissolve. It's going to be about a teaspoon. And let that dissolve. And then slowly, we're going to add, not our flour, we're going to add our sesame seed oil. Yeah. We're going to add about two and a half, not two, two teaspoons of sesame seed oil to your dough. Well, it's about two. And then slowly, by the half cup, we're going to slowly add our flours. Add about half a cup of flour, mix it, add another half, mix it. And you want to slowly integrate because we don't want any lumps in our dough or in our wrapper. We want a smooth consistency. And we do want it, if you think about like pasta dough, it might be slightly softer than a pasta dough, like a semolina flour with egg. Um, but the bread flour, because the bread flour has more structure to it, more protein, that's what gives our wrappers a nice bite. Um, if you think about, you know, good dumplings or wrappers, gyoza, um, pot stickers, you want that wrapper just to have a slight a slight bite. You know, I like mine to have a nice bite. I don't like them too mushy. I like to kind of bite into it. And I can tell this is almost ready. And if you're mixing your dough, the one reason why it's not good to keep your flour separate in a separate bowl is that if you do start to feel your dough becoming drier, you can stop there and kind of, you know, knead out your dough a little bit and check in with it before. I mean, not saying that I have not done this, but many of times I've just added all the flour and realized it was way too much flour. And then, then you're just okay. in a guessing game. First question of the night. Um, <laughs> the cornstarch comes later, right? That's like yeah, the, the cornstarch. Yes, cornstarch comes for dusting and making sure that they don't stick together. be honest, I almost thought the same thing when I was looking at the recipe and getting everything ready. I was about to mix a cornstarch with my flowers. I was like, wait, this is not what they're for. So don't worry about it. All right, I'm feeling the dough. Mine's, if it feels soft, like more like a bread dough, you still need to add a little bit more flour, but I would slowly add it in and probably knead it by hand in the bowl. We don't want any dry spots, but we definitely don't want it to be too wet. And I think I am actually good on flour. So you can tell now, if you can see, it's kind of shaggy in my bowl. There's some extra flour left over. 
It's all in there if you want to take a look. But I think I'm good on flour. So it's probably about a cup and a fourth. Maybe Portland was a little dry today. What was that? I didn't hear it. Was there a question? Okay. So I'm just slowly start to knead it into a ball. Once it's come into a good ball, no extra flour or anything. And it's starting to come into a smoother ball. Got this extra flour. I'm gonna turn it out. If you also have a stand mixer, a lot easier and probably a lot quicker. But if you wanna build those muscles, it's a great way. Kneading wrapper dough. I can tell this has become one solid form. The flour has been pretty absorbed. Now, I'm gonna put that dirty bowl up there. I'm just gonna knead it until it's smooth. Which should be in a stand mixer, it might be about hmm, four minutes. So we might need it for a little bit. If you have a partner or someone on the side, you can tag team it. But we really just want it to get it till it's smooth. And usually, it doesn't take too long. You can start to feel the dough get softer and get that flour absorbed, the gluten absorbing the flour. I'm getting ready to be delicious little dumplings. <laughs> That's what I say at the market because a lot of people ask why I chose gyoza and usually my answer is who doesn't like a dumpling? I haven't found anyone of any shape or form that doesn't like a dumpling. All right. This is oh, getting healthy. Yes. As always, I'm your worst student because I'm not prepared and I didn't sift. So what happens if you don't sift? Your flour. If you didn't sift, you know, well, my grandmother would be scolding me because I didn't sift either. <laughs> but I think sifting, it just really, you know, sifting, may, I really make sure that you are not going to have any clumps in your wrapper dough. If you don't sift, there's probably a greater chance of it clumping of your flour clumping and creating that little flour pocket as you're um, rolling out your dough. You know, if another way to prevent that is, you know, even if you didn't sift it, adding the flour slowly is another way to prevent um, a lot of clumping and having those flour pockets. It creates, can create a softer and silkier texture. All right. I can tell that my dough is almost there. <laughs> this is why we're starting with the dough first, because it needs the most love. And, or, it can be like the saying, like, you should do the things first that you don't want to do first. So you can just get it over with. No. <laughs> this is just to make sure that our dough has an adequate time to rest. So, so I think it's just about ready. I can tell that this needs about probably another minute or two. If uh, people don't want to do this next time, I did find gyoza wrappers, not potstick or one-ton wrappers at H Mart. Oh. So. Yes, this is definitely a labor of love and a great arm workout on a squeaky table. I don't know if you can hear my squeaky table. What if we bought wonton wrappers and not gyoza wrappers? Wonton wrappers have an uh, egg. <laughs> yeah, uh, but wonton, and I think they're, not, they're usually on square as well. They're usually the same process, just with more egg in it. But 
the great dough, or I can tell my dough is smooth and it's a good butt. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna kind of pinch it in. If you're still kneading, no worries. Or if you're not kneading and you're just watching us, now you can start to participate a little bit more. So I'm going to make sure it's just an even circle. And then I'm gonna divide it into four sections. I'm gonna cut it. If you would like to be exact, you can do a scale, make sure it's equal. And then we're gonna wrap it, each piece um, in plastic wrap or beeswax wrap um, to make sure they get all nice and ready for us. Those two. So Kelsey, what do we do if it's not, it's still kind of like, not like yours? <laughs> That's all right. Just a little bit more kneading. It takes a little bit of love. Um, how I, kneading. When I say kneading, I think, now that I think about it, you know, kneading, especially dough, one way that I like to knead, I don't know if this is common sense or maybe not common sense, but something that we think about a lot. But a good way to knead is thinking about going around a circle and clockwise. So I take one hand and always push it in the center. So I take my right hand to push down and then I fold the top with my left hand over, kind of folding it over in half. And then I turn it about 25 degrees, push down in the middle, flip it a little bit, push down in the middle, flip, and just kind of getting that same motion so it kind of stays shaped. I know kneading, especially when you're kneading dough, uh, bread dough, you know, having that rhythm creates a really nice texture throughout the dough um, and it rises really nicely rather than maybe kind of pushing it. I know there's lots of other ways to knead dough where you're slapping the dough down, um, getting that gluten to build up. But once you've reached that really nice um, kind of pliable dough, somewhat like a, I don't know, like a good pliable dough, um, kind of like fondant in a way, having that kneading motion, uh, one is a little bit easier because then it, your hands can get used to it and the dough is not, the, you can control the dough and the dough won't control you. Um, but this kind of dough. What are doing with the dough? Let's see. I know Cindy's still kneading. <laughs> <laughs> I can see Cindy. <laughs> with this kind of dough though, Kelsey, does it, um, can you over knead it? Um, possibly in a hand mixer, you could knead it, but it would have to be about, it would be like 20 minutes over in a stand mixer. Okay. I think by hand mixing, hand kneading, you'd probably get, unless you're super strong and I respect that, but you probably get tired after about 10 minutes. And that's about the time um, it would need, I think by hand, because in the stand mixer, it's about five minutes or so. And really it doesn't need, it does need to be smooth, but at least have it in a good pliable, you know, you can push down on it, on the dough and it kind of leaves a good indent, but not, doesn't go fully through. You can leave an indent, but the indent slowly starts to pop up from the thumb. And then go ahead and yeah, divide that in fourths. Um, and let's see, I'm gonna make sure that everyone's kind of, following and doing all right. And after the dough rests for a little bit, it should be a little bit warm still, but it'll rest and that dough will combine. It'll be <clears throat> easier to roll out. So if we're ready, I think I'm gonna go ahead. Let's see. I'm just gonna double check the room and I'm on my phone. So I'm just gonna double check, make sure. Got people looking at me, got people. All right. I want to see everybody else's. <laughs> I don't think mine looks right. <laughs> mine is so lumpy. Yours looks good, Annie. 
I just, you couldn't hear me because I was muted, but I was like, it's all James. <laughs> That's my strong partner who just got to work out with me. <laughs> He's really into bread, so he's like, yeah. <laughs> he knows. He knows the need. Now he's measuring the it on the scale. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I might end up with meatballs. Okay, Kelsey. First question, if we don't have plastic wrap. Plastic wrap, I would use, um, I would actually probably put it in a bowl, not having the pieces touch too much, and then putting a wet, pa wet paper towel or a wet cloth over it. Okay. Just to lock that in. That's what I'm going to do. If you would like to be eco-friendly and not use plastic wrap, beeswax wrap is totally fine as well. So once, okay, I think we're kind of getting ready. I'm going to start with our filling. So traditionally in Japanese gyoza, you know, there's gyoza, there's pot stickers, there's um, gyoza, there's mandu, there's wonton, so many dumplings. There's dumplings, like chicken and dumplings. Um, but for Japanese, usually the, it's what's in the filling and the way that you make the wrapper and usually the method of cooking that can kind of be item, not itemized, <laughs> can be placed into which country. Um, Japanese gyoza usually has seasoning of sake, soy sauce, and sesame seed oil. And usually we'll have Napa cabbage or some sort of veggie. So today for our filling, we're not gonna use Napa cabbage because it is Japanese gyoza. Um, we're gonna use shredded carrot and apple. Uh, in Japanese curry, usually there is something sweet, whether that's a raisin or apples. I grew up, my mom would always put uh, Granny Smith apples in our curry. Um, and I thought everyone did that until I realized, no, like not very many people do that. But that sweetness, um, if you've had, you know, the Japanese curry blocks, usually they might have like a honey apple flavor or um, there's just that sweetness to it in the Japanese curry. And so having this apple, one gives it some nice texture and it also provides that little bit of sweetness that you find in Japanese curry. So I have a bowl. Um, I have a pound of raw ground beef. If you'd like to veganize it, you could easily substitute this with impossible meat or beyond beef. Very easy substitution. Um, so we have our ground beef. I have um, one medium carrot that's been peeled and shredded. So I just use it, used, I used it, I used my grater to grate it, um, soaked it in a little bit of water so it didn't turn to, but that's about, it's about half a cup. It's about, yeah, I would say half a cup of carrots. And then the rest of these has about a fourth of a Fuji apple. Now, in, re in reality, I think just having a crisp apple, whether that's a Fuji, a Gala, even Granny Smith, something, an apple with like a good crunch would work well into these gyoza. Um, Fuji is just one that we regularly have in our home and is a slightly sweeter and a little bit crisp. <coughs> why we, I chose this, but of course, I think in home cooking and in any recipe, having what you need, like have, using what you have, um, rather than, I think, going the extra mile for something really specific, unless it's highly important. But for apples, I think we're good with a variety of apples, as long as it's not red delicious. That's my only, I, I don't have too much beef with red delicious, but not in the gyoza. So I put the apple, the carrots, and I have two or three green onions, white, and the green parts chopped. And that's about a fourth of a cup. You could use just the white parts. Um, you could use Nara chives or regular chives, always kind of substituting using what you have. Okay, so we have our apple or green onion. How are we doing? If I'm going too fast, I know I have a lot of things prepped and so they can go a little bit quick for me but I can slow down a little bit. I'll give it a little second. I'm gonna start to mix it a little bit. 
Hey, Kelsey, I'm just curious um, if you don't use like Impossible Burger, could tofu fit into this? Um, that I was actually thinking about this right before this class. Um, I had the same question. I think you could use tofu for our vegan gyoza that we make our not umamis. We do use tofu, but I would use an extra firm tofu and then press it. So you're really getting as much moisture as you can out of it. So you can put that between two paper towels or two cloth towels, um, something heavy on it, let it press for about 30 minutes or so. Uh, my, and I actually, you know, in my head, I'm thinking about like tofu, what else could go with it, you know, giving it that structure because beef has, you know, it, it'll form into itself. I would probably add a cabbage to it as well. Um, okay. Just okay. so it has a little bit more texture than just tofu and seasonings. I would give, um, I would put a little bit of cabbage in that as well. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks, thanks for you. asking. Sure. How about mushrooms? Yeah, mushrooms as well. They will adjust the flavor, you know, unless you use like a button mushroom or like a white mushroom that doesn't have too much like of a strong presence, like that could be a good texture if it used not superly fine chopped mushrooms, but I think a well chopped mushroom. Um, shiitake, if you did a blend of like white or cremini, I probably wouldn't use portobello because those are pretty meaty and have a lot of liquid in them. And you don't want too much liquid in your filling. So I use, you know, your white, your cremini. If you did it with a blend of, gosh, now you could, you could go really exciting with this. You could go shiitake, you could do maitake, you could, any oyster mushrooms as long, any kind of meaty mushroom that gives it um, a good texture, probably blended with tofu to also have that, I think, I'm just thinking about that mouthfeel, right? Yeah. So. Same thing, they'll probably get all the water off of it as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I wanted to mention something. Yeah. This last two years at the Colorado Farmer's Market, there's been this guy who sells young ginger. So if you can find it, buy it because um, you don't have to peel it. So you can what? throw it in the freezer and then just pull out what you need. And then you can just grate it straight away without peeling it, which is so awesome. Hmm. Good to know. All right, so I'm gonna get back to our filling. So we put our apple, our carrot, our green onion. I have two garlic cloves that were grated. Um, they can be finely chopped or minced. Um, if you have a little microplane grater, grating them is super easy. Or if you're in the Portland area and if you've seen, I don't know what their name is, but the little ceramic plate with spikes and you can grate ginger, garlic, jalapenos, if you've gone to a farmer, farmer's market and you've seen them. Um, those are really fun to have, have one. Um, and then I have about an inch of grated ginger. I'm gonna add that to our bowl and into the dish. When you say an inch, like, is that like the length of the piece or? Your, your, to your thumb, to your first like, um, your first line on your thumb, that much ginger. But like all the way around, right? Not like all the way around, yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> Good question. Yeah, so an inch can be a chunk. It's about a tablespoon of freshly chopped ginger. Um, two large garlic cloves. You know, I love cooking, but recipe writing, I'm not a fan of because I really cook just from sight and looking at things and so having to kind of measure it down to okay what would an inch of ginger be or what would be a splash of this um because i think cooking in itself you know as you're learning and getting used to cooking if you're learning you having a recipe and measurements is great because then you can understand how much of one ingredient would taste in a recipe but you know if you're kind of more confident and able to play around and being comfortable you know doing a splash of this and really more going off of your intuition. Um, that's where cooking gets really fun. I mean, cooking is fun all around, but knowing, having confidence in your skills as well. So, all right, back to the filling. We have ginger, garlic. I'm also going to add a tablespoon of ketchup. And then I'm gonna add about 
two tablespoons of soy sauce. About a teaspoon or so of sake. I'm a little for the chef. And I know that in the recipe, um, I think in the recipe it says no sesame seed oil. We're just gonna go with a feeling. You don't have to add sesame seed oil, but you can add just a little drizzle, probably about a teaspoon of sesame seed oil to your filling if you'd like, but it'd be just a tiny bit. Sesame seed oil has a pretty strong flavor. I'm not the biggest fan when it's super sesame seedy. So just putting that tiny bit just gives it a really nice warmth. And then we're gonna add the two tablespoons of the Masi Masa Japanese gold curry blend. And I don't know if you've opened your spice blend or not. I've had this in a ramekin for this, uh, for this class and I've been smelling it. It's so strong, it's, which is, means that you have great spices. If you, can, you wanna smell your spice. But I have been, that has just been wafting the whole night. All right, so I have my filling. We're gonna give it a little mix. Make sure it's well incorporated. If you'd like, you can use your hands. If you're cooking with a friend or a child, this is something, or a teenager, this is something I think is pretty fun to do is you can mix it with your hands which is what I'm going to do now. Kelsey, can I ask a question? Yeah. If I'm using ground turkey, when we get to the cooking part, will I have to cook longer? No. Okay. Um, it's just making sure that your cooking temperature comes up to um, 165. But okay. it should, it will in our cooking temperature. Okay. Um, I know that sometimes um, ground turkey can be a little bit moist just like ground chicken okay so if it's a little if it seems a little bit wet or even if your ground beef has a higher fat content so mine has 90 10 i'm pretty sure meaning 90 percent lean 10 percent fat um you can always add about like a teaspoon of cornstarch and that will help just kind of bind um, okay Kelsey, yeah, if you have a little bit too much fat, like an 80, 20, or even more, um, putting in a little bit of cornstarch just helps retain that structure and the filling. Yeah. Were Any we questions? supposed to put two tablespoons of vegetable oil in the mixture? Yes. Okay. As well, add it two tablespoons of oil. I would. And sesame too? Um, yeah, just a tiny bit. I'd say about one teaspoon of sesame seed oil, if you'd like okay. to add that. Okay, thank you. Mine is pretty well mixed. We're going to take a five second, not five second, 30 second, because you can wash your hands for that long, 30 second hand washing. So I'll be right back. So we have our filling done. I'm gonna put that aside. How are we doing? Did you say, did somebody just ask, we're supposed to put the vegetable oil in the mixture? Yes, so oh. there's a little bit of vegetable oil in the mixture. Um, and okay. then we'll also be using vegetable oil to be frying up the gyoza. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you can see it. It is pretty, solid easily you know you know if your dough isn't wet enough or it shouldn't be wet enough um if you can form a little ball if you can form like a meat like meat ball like patty a little ball means your pat your filling is good to go if it's really wet you said add cornstarch 
Sorry, can you say that again? I oh. can't hear things great. <laughs> Ours is still pretty wet. Uh, should we add cornstarch? Did you say that? Yeah, I would add a tablespoon of cornstarch. Okay, thank you. Yes. All right. As people are getting their filling ready, I'm going to do it just a little bit of cleaning in my workspace because we're going to get ready for the wrappers. So I know that you have a buddy with, oh, yeah. I know you said in your recipe to sit down while you're wrapping. So does anybody need to move before we wrap? <laughs> we'll need yes. to time to move. <laughs> yes. yes, if you need to move. Well, I was just about to say, you know, it's nice if you have a partner with you because making dumplings, making gyoza um, is something you usually do with family or friends, you know, someone with you. Um, as you can tell, it is, a, it is a lot of work for one person, which is why when, you know, I grew up, my mom would make it, make the filling, make the wrappers sometimes. <laughs> um, and then oh, would call all, all of us to the kitchen to make sure that we're helping and folding because it goes a lot quicker. Um, and you're able to talk more, uh, see who has the best folding, come up with your own kind of folds. Um, and makes those memories just last a little bit longer. Kind of like crazy rich Asians. Yeah, a little bit like that. I mean, and I think, well, a lot of dishes are like that. And a lot of, you know, if you think about pasta making, um, you know, these women or like these communities that make big meals and have these like big family meals, you know, my, I'm lucky enough to also experience, you know, family with my husband, because his family's here. Um, and they're from Mexico and so having like big meals and everyone cooking together and, you know it's 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 something I think very heartwarming when you're able to experience it and very welcoming you know it's not expected it's just appreciated having people in the kitchen being able to make a meal and um, sharing it together which is what we're doing tonight so I am going to just roll out two of my fourths of the dough um, there's only two of us tonight. Each dough ball will make about 12 to 14 little gyoza wrappers. Um, so if that's enough for you, or if we want to do one or two of these wrappers, can also this dough can be saved for and refrigerated for one day and can be made for tomorrow. Or if you can, you can wrap out the rest of the roll out the rest of these wrappers and finish them and then make sure they're well corded coated in cornstarch and then able to freeze them and those will last about I would say about a month or so if they're well wrapped that's the key can we have a quick question um, yes all right so I have two questions did we add the rice vinegar already no so rice vinegar will just go into the dipping sauce and the salad dressing all right, and if we have the cheater wrappers, should we wet those? They seem kind of dry. Uh, we will. So when we're folding and going through that, then we'll use water to seal them and make sure awesome. they open. Thank you. Yes. So I'm gonna go ahead, if you are getting ready with your wrappers, I can tell that this, this guy's ready. This guy's ready, oh yeah. So I'm gonna sprinkle my cutting board with a little bit of cornstarch. I'm gonna roll this into a log about an inch or so in diameter. And then I'm going to cut it about 14. Yeah, we'll cut 14 little rounds. Let's see if we can do that. There is one. Two, three, four, five. Perfect. Seven. Some might be bigger, some might be smaller. That's why it's home cooking. And it's all about the taste. A so one inch log. What? A one inch log cut into 14 pieces. Yeah, so what I just did was I cut it in half 
And then I cut that, those two halves into seven pieces. And I kind of estimated, so probably one will be a little bit bigger than the other. Um, the ends of my logs <laughs> were a little bit smaller than the middle part, and that's okay. It will still taste delicious. So I'm gonna- We don't need a rolling pin, we just do it by hand. Oh yeah, by hand, we don't need a rolling pin. I think I added that to the kitchen list. Need that. <laughs> If you have a rolling pin, that would be great. Um, so I cut into 14 pieces right here. I'm gonna stay at 14 right now, just because I want enough space um, to go through everything. So with mine, what I've done, once you've cut them into their individual pieces, I've kind of flattened the piece. Um, you can also cover this with a cotton, the other wrappers with a, cotton towel or a paper towel just to make sure they don't dry out too much. But I have my little wrapper. I'm gonna kind of press it down to make it shape into a dumpling wrapper. If you have a large rolling pin, totally fine. If you have a little mini rolling pin, even better. If you have a wine glass that's or a wine bottle, that's fine. Um, or you can use your hands and just kind of use the palm of your hand. So what I'm gonna do with my wrapper, I'm gonna put, let's see, we're gonna wait a second, just to make sure everyone's here. Like, could you show the, the process of like, yeah, making it so the I first just, step? <laughs> yeah, with my, it's kind of like making a pizza dough. You know how with a pizza dough, you kind of stretch it out a little bit, you make it into a little dough. So I'm just kind of pinching it with my fingers kind of shaping it into a circle, kind of making it into it, into a wrapper. And then what if it's about a fourth of an inch, you can use a rolling pin. Okay, we're gonna take an excellent an explanation moment. You can use a rolling pin. If you wanna make life even easier, you could use a pasta maker and crank it out and just cut it um or by pre-made wrappers <laughs> or you could roll it out in one long sheet and then kind of cut it like ravioli um with a rolling pin or a pasta maker um individually i think it's just a little easier when you're using a small dough um rolling pin so i'm just going to roll it out in the middle and slowly kind of stretch it kind of turn it every quarter of a circle till it gets thinner. This was my larger piece, so I can tell this guy's going to be slightly plump. And to make sure that we have consistency, you can take a glass cup, put it into your wrapper and cut it out. I would sprinkle a little bit more cornstarch on it just so that it doesn't stick to it and then put it aside. And we have one wrapper ready. Um, one thing about the leftovers, technically, not tech, gyoza wrapper can be, wrappers can be really similar, especially when they're freshly made to noodles, to fresh noodles, because it's flour, salt, and hot water. Um, I'm, I'm a big person on low waste um, and trying to use things, something that I learned from my mom, something I learned from my grandma. And usually when I make fresh wontons or gyoza wrappers, I save the extras, the little side pieces, and make them as noodles. Um, you can boil them just for about 30 seconds or so, top it with, uh, you can make a really yummy sauce. It can be a fresh noodle sauce with some oyster sauce, chili paste, or a little soy sauce, sugar, some stir fried chicken, green onions, if you'd like. That's also not a requirement, something that I will save. But we're just gonna continue Fold or wrapping. Oh my goodness. <laughs> We're going to continue rolling out the wrappers. 
I wonder, Cindy, if you wanted to talk, or just if you're willing to talk a little bit about what made you guys want to start with, or not start, but come out with the Japanese gold curry in that process. So I think most of you guys know us, but we started our company because we wanted to cook things at home. And every time we went to make it, it was like defeating. <laughs> so, cause you had to have all the spices and you always didn't have one or, and it was just like too much to deal with. So we started making our blends and we did um, tikka masala first and then we did a Thai and uh, we have a Moroccan blend and then we're like, wait a second, Japanese curry, because we, as a Japanese American, I grew up eating Japanese curry, but it was always from that brick. And when you look at the ingredients on the brick, not so good. So um, we thought, well, there's gotta be a different way to do this. So we started researching it and some cooks, uh, there's a woman named Sonoka Sakai. She actually has recipes to make your own curry bricks. But what we kind of liked about doing it the way we did it is that you can make Japanese curry with it with the recipe that's on the pack, but also um, you can make other things with it. So we use it in fried rice. My husband uses it on steak as a seasoning. So there's lots of different ways you can get that flavor in. And uh, Japanese curry is uh, traditionally, it's a, it's um, the curry itself is like a roux based curry. So it's heavy butter <laughs> and, and flour. Um, and it was actually brought to Japan by the British Royal Navy. And it became like a mess hall thing in Japan. And then of course, like Japanese, they go crazy about something. And Japanese curry is actually kind of like the national dish of Japan. And it's something that we all, as you know, a California and Japanese people grew up eating and, and pretty much any Japanese American, Kelsey, because I know you probably grew up eating it too. So how many of you all, besides Pam, <laughs> um, had eaten Japanese curry before this class? like not everybody yeah like three or four or five of you my sister was like what there's curry like in Japanese cuisine there's curry like she didn't even know so she's gonna be stoked <laughs> to try these I was like yeah <laughs> go to Kelsey's house <laughs> yeah um so yeah so it's it's um been a fun blend for us we have lots of kid fans at the farmer's markets because there's no heat <laughs> so uh, we have one, one uh, farmer's market vendor, she makes ghee and her daughter comes to the market every weekend with her and she always walks down with her $5 and gets her weekly fix. So it's pretty cool. Um, the other thing I was gonna talk about while we're rolling is what to drink. So yes. <laughs> how many people got sake? Yeah, yay, Leanna. How many uh, people like have had sake before? How many people like sake? Well, there's only a few of you yeah, that have had it. So I think most of us also, it's like growing up, well, we didn't drink sake till we were 21, but <laughs> hot sake, it was always like the thing at every sushi bar, it was like sake and um, it was always hot. And generally, and today it's pretty much like passe to drink it hot, except for certain places, I guess. But um, so most of the sake now is drank has is you drink it at room temperature or a little chilled, and there's different kinds of sakes and they're based how they taste is based on how much they polish the rice grain and how much of the rice grain is polished away before they make the sake out of the rice. Most of the sake that we get here in in um, the U.S. is um, pasteurized but there is also unpasteurized sake, which I didn't really know about. And we were just down at 10,000 Waves down in Santa Fe and they have a Japanese restaurant there and they had an unpasteurized flight and it was really delicious. It has a little bit of a funk to it, which was, it was mm -hmm. really good. Um, so what I did for tonight's class is I made a cheat sheet for sake, beer and green tea. And I'll share it with you all after the class. And I actually just gave a link to the PDF for the uh, restaurant down at 10,000 10, Wave because they had a really nice sake list. So if you're like, I want to try sake, but I don't know what to try. I give you that, gave you that list. We also work with a Japanese restaurant up in Boulder and they have a really extensive sake list as well. And we actually wrote a primer for them for their sake. So I included a link to that. 
Um, but tonight we're going to talk about there's sort of like these two areas of sake that you can get here that you can get clear sake that is different types. Kelsey, you can speak the Japanese. I don't speak any Japanese, so I'm an embarrassment to my race. Um, but <laughs> so there's like, Pam, I don't know about you. Maybe I'm with you. <laughs> so, um, but then there's sort of like the clear sakes and then there's an unfiltered sake and nigori sake. Yeah, which I really love. It's really cloudy and pearl-like and that's delicious. It's usually a little bit sweeter sweeter so i think we're going to use some sake right in our we put it in our filling our, oh that's right i didn't put it in <laughs> um also sake is optional but if for sake if you're in the portland metro area forest grove has a sake um distillery sake i don't think it's a distillery it's not a distillery sake <laughs> store um sake shop and it's called momokawa there's another one in forest grove um, but Momokawa, if you go to, if you're in the Portland area, um, Uwajimaya in Beaverton is a Japanese Asian market. Um, it is, you know, it has a variety of foods, but it's more Japanese um, centric. And so they have a really great um, sake selection that you can choose from. And usually right in the center is Momokawa and it's a blue bottle. And yeah. they, do have a, they have a creamy pearl one. They have some pear flavored ones. Um, sake can, you know, Cindy was talking about it being filtered, um, but sake, you, you can have sparkling sake, which is really yummy. Um, it's slightly sweet. That's um, one way I got my husband hooked on it because he likes sweet things. So I just gave him sparkling sake. Um, but you can have sparkling sake. There's usually flavored ones um, like mango or strawberry sake because it's, kind of new. it's very easily, yeah, it's very easily mixed um, with fruit. Um, so they also have the, the cans that you can get, which are fun. Yes. The, in Japan, you can go like on the streets and the train station and get like sake and beer out of a vending machine. Mm -hmm. So the Japanese sake, you know, you can get it, get it here in cans as well. There's also in Colorado, if you're down here, there's a Colorado sake company as well. And then I think the, the distillery up by you, Kelsey, in that area is one sake. So I put oh, a, yeah, I think there's one in sake. Mm -hmm. I, put that, there's two. I put that in the in the um, cheat sheet as well. Oh, very so nice. I think I'm gonna drink. Okay. I have this one called Night Swim. We'll see. The little guys are fun and they have or the can. <laughs> yeah, and if you go to a lot or a lot of Asian markets like H Mart, um, Uwaji Maya. The little sake cups are really nice because then you can try out different ones um, and see if you liked it or not, rather than buying kampai, Cindy. Kampai. Cheers yep. in Japanese. Kampai. All right, I am almost done. I'm on my last wrapper. Try shimmy that off. And I'm going to wipe down my board. How's everyone doing on the wrappers? Wait, so how many people bought wrappers? Gosh, I should have done that too. <laughs> so you've just been enjoying watching on me and us talk about sake and roll wrappers. It's a great game. I always say it is a cooking class, but it can be a show too. It can be a show too. Well, my how many wrappers should we have made if we're making them? <laughs> can you say that again? I'm sorry. About how many should we have made if we're making the wrappers? Um, well, I say a good serving is between six to eight dumplings per person. Um, that's if it's like, if gyoza are the main dish, you're only eating gyoza, uh, six to seven is a good, or six to eight is a good number. Then again, I know a lot of people, like that people who bought my gyoza can finish a whole dozen. So it's really <laughs> however much you would like. Um, I, you know, one little block of mine made 14 and I know just for two of us and for the time of our class, I'm just gonna make this much. If you have multiple people and you have the salad and maybe some extra stuff, then I would say four to five gyoza per person. And for so, the amount of the filling, about how much does that usually make? Oh. And the filling, well, the filling would, it will fill about 
30 or so gyoza, 30 to 40, depending. Um, the filling can also be easily refrigerated um, or re refrigerated or froze, freezed, frozen, can be frozen. <laughs> Been a long day, been a long day. <laughs> but a lot of times, even if you bought pre pre made wrappers, there's always if you have the perfect amount, it's a great day. But usually, you might have a couple of extra wrappers, you might have some extra filling, and those can be easily filled. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I don't know if that was clear enough. I made the full pound of beef, I probably won't use a full pound, so I'm gonna freeze some of mine. But I see my wrappers are done. So if we have then the extra like three balls of dough, how should we store those? I'm sorry, Annie, can you say that again? I just, uh, we, have, we have like three extra balls of dough then because we only made okay. one. Yeah, what should we so do? So then I would wrap them in cling wrap. Um, you can refrigerate them um, to make more wrappers. And then from those wrappers, you can freeze it. You could also roll them out flat and make noodles, make some fresh pasta if you'd like. Um, so you have options. But what we're gonna, so if everyone has, so it seems like a lot of people have wrappers. Um, I'm going to kind of wipe down my spot. So Kelsey, if you don't want to make um, noodles or and you can, and you have your scraps, can you re-roll it out or will it not work? Um, actually, but like you can re-roll it out. But when I did it, I honestly just took these like little scraps from the wrappers and just threw them in boiling water and topped them with some like sesame seed oil, soy sauce, and some chili paste. Um, the next time I got kind of creative and sauteed up some mushrooms and green onions and put it on, but I really, you can re-roll it if you want, or you can just use the wrappers or the little extras. Up to you. Okay. So now for, we're going to start with folding. Better pay attention. So in the recipe, I have two instructions for folding. One is super easy. It's the way I actually grew up with because my, you know, when you have to feed a lot of children, you just want it quick and easy. Um, and teaching kids, it's a really easy way. So we're gonna do that way, which is just a simple half moon fold. And then we're gonna, I'll do the five fold traditional gyoza, which is just folding five pleats in one direction. When she gave me the instructions, I was like, uh yeah if you're a more visual person why well, will go through it visually so can people see kelsey because i'm kelsey i'm wondering if you can zoom or when you're i wonder if i can get closer let's um, you should be able to closer. pin her too like i don't are you zoom controller cindy you should be able to pin her for everybody maybe that's or let's everybody see, can just closer. go to the right like upper right corner of the three dots of her spotlight for everybody or okay. or bottom yeah and then uh, pin pin her, and that makes her video the biggest one. Is she spotlighted now for everybody? Even for myself? Yes. Fabulous. Closer help, too. Okay. All right, here we go. So I can't see any of you. It's kind of like when just bringing me flashbacks to like working in an office when I'm sharing my screen and I can't see anyone else but I can see my screen and myself until Google updated it and then you could see everyone but I'm <laughs> thinking back to the office all right so we have a wrapper we're going to start with a simple way very straightforward so you're going to put a little bit of water on the top half edge of my top of the one wonton of the gyoza wrapper. So really just this half moon along the top edge. Then you're gonna take about, mm, about a tablespoon of filling or so and put it right in the middle. Okay, so the super easy way, you're gonna fold it over in the middle or pinch it at the top. And then you're just gonna pinch it down, move your fingers down, and then you're just gonna press it down. 
And so it's a easy, very easy flat on the bottom, pinch on top. If you'd like, you can add just a little bit of water to make sure it's well sealed. And that guy is ready to go. And if you'd like, you can just continue making them like that and ignore me for the next demonstration. But next, we're going to make the five pleats. So I'm going to demonstrate without the filling first. So what we're going to do is you're going to pinch it at the middle just so that you can get it nice and up on top. And then you're going to start with this front edge, this front flap, the front part of the wonton. So I'm going from right to left, starting, I have my right hand doing the pinching. All right, and so we're gonna, you're gonna start at the bottom and slowly pinch five times, five pleats, moving about an inch or so, about half an inch, not half, not an inch, half an inch um, separate from each pleat, if that makes sense. Well, we're gonna go through it really quick. So again, we'll put water at the top of the gyoza wrapper, put about a tablespoon or so of filling. That's a lot of filling. You're gonna go to the top to make sure it can kind of stick together. So I'm gonna take this front flap, keep my left finger here at the bottom to stabilize it. You're gonna take about an inch and you're gonna pleat down to that corner. So and just, your left finger is going to move up to the top of your first pleat. Then you're going to move your right hand again another inch. And you're going to fold to the left. Again, move up an inch, fold to the left. Up an inch, fold to the left. And then you're going to do that final fold. And it might be about four or five folds, depending on how big your wrapper was. And it should come out like that. That's kind of bright. Okay, so everybody hold yours up. <laughs> I can't see them, so I'm gonna put them back on on everybody everybody view. Let's just think about taste. <laughs> it's very important, and looks well. Don't matter so much. Yes. In ja in Japanese cuisine and culture. Presentation actually is very important, um, but tonight we don't have to worry about that because we're in the home. I think a lot of times there's so much pressure to make, to, especially with Instagram and Facebook now, to make sure that food looks perfect, right? Like I feel that way. Um, when we forget that food is, nourish, it's supposed to be nourishing to us and comforting and having this anxiety of making everything look good rather than just being thankful that we have food, it, tastes good, whether it looks good or not, um, and that you made it. Um, that's the great thing about home cooking. So I'm going to go ahead and keep on. As I talk, I'm just going to start folding. So Jenna, Can you do the five one again? Yes. So I'm, I put water on the top. I put my filling in the middle. So we're going to go from right to left but your right hand is actually starting. So your hands will start in the same corner. And then you're actually, you're gonna go from like your hand is right to left, but your hand will be going down the wrapper to the other side. So I fold it in half. I take the first inch of the first fold right here, right here. Sometimes you'll pinch the whole thing and then just start folding, but it's just that front flap. And then you're going to take about an inch of it and fold it down into your left hand. Then you'll pleat it again. Move your finger down, move it over another pleat. So it kind of looks like that. Sorry about the light. It's really bright on it. And then I'm going to finish with two more pleats to seal it. God. All right. Is Sometimes I will say sometimes I in our gyoza I actually don't fold them like this because I'm not I'm not the quickest of it. So if I this is in the recipe, but if you'd like to learn the way we fold them at Naomami's, it's really quick and actually I think a little bit easier. 
depending on how your hands kind of move. So I put, again, water on the top half. I'm gonna put about a spoonful of filling in the middle. So this is the pleats that we make for our pork gyoza, which is three folds towards the middle. So I'm gonna pinch it in the middle. I'm gonna start from on, the, on my right side. I'm gonna take that first pleat or the first front wrapper. I'm gonna move my right finger down half an inch. Then I'm gonna fold it, pleat it towards the center. Move my finger down half an inch. Fold it, pleat it towards the center. Move down half an inch and do that third, that third pleat. So now I have three pleats going towards the center. And now I'm gonna do the same thing on the other side, but with my left hand moving it towards the center. Rather than all of them going one direction, they're gonna go all towards the center. So I'm gonna, again, with my left hand now, that front full front wrapper, gonna go down half an inch and pleat to the middle. So let's see if that looks. And okay. then I'm going to do move my finger down half, and then do that final pinch right at the end. Give it a little water to seal it. And okay. that is maybe something that you have seen at a wood farmer's market. All right, show of hands, who got it? <laughs> show of hands, who wants to see it again? <laughs> I can't do the five pleat one, but I got the three pleat one. I'm feeling pretty, nice. pretty good about it having any form at all. <laughs> we just we can't see. Would we like to see it again? I think some people want to see it again. Okay, we're the three, the the three fold or the center fold. Well, show of hands, three fold, five fold, five fold. Okay. So I put water at the top, got my filling. So if I'm thinking about how my hands are moving, my left hand, I know this is probably reversed for you, but my left hand is holding the little bottom cord in. I'm starting with my right an inch, grabbing that front fold, pinching down to meet my, to meet my left hand. So I'm gonna pinch that together. Then it's gonna move up another half inch. My left hand holds that, my right hand is going to fold that next pleat. Pinch, center, and you're just going to kind of move down the line. So we're going to start at the bottom. We're going to pinch one down, move up an inch. I don't know if this is any better. Pinch, move, <laughs> move it up, pinch. Oh. So your fingers, so you're, you're not trying to fold all five down into the bottom like this. I guess I should have been more clear that's on me. So your hands are slowly, you're going to start at that first fold down. They're going to move up half an inch. The next fold, move up half an inch, next fold. And that's going to be five times. Okay. To make the five fold. So I do have to say something. We thought this class was going to go for an hour, but it looks like we're going to go more like an hour and a half-ish. Everybody, yeah, okay? once these are, everybody once okay? Once you have enough of your, if you've just been watching me and you've been busting them out, um, you should probably have enough ready by now if you've just been watching. Um, also, if you have pre-made wrappers, those might be a little bit easier to fold than handmade wrappers. So I'm probably going to make a couple more, then we just need to cook them, which will take about eight minutes. During that time, we'll make our salad dressing and our dipping sauce and we'll be done. So I would say, yeah, maybe another- 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Is that all right with everyone? Yeah. All right. Okay, cool. Great. I'm gonna make a couple more. Well, I'm gonna make them the easy way. Just pinching at top and then pushing down and making a nice little flat guy. He kind of looks like a jellyfish or like some sort of fish that has 
this nice little spine. Another way, if you'd like, I don't know if I should throw another way, is just pinching at top and using your this part of your thumb to pinch both sides, kind of like a half moon, and then pinching it down <laughs> with the homemade wrapper. It may make a really big waveable gyoza. Can't be home cooking if you're not having fun. I mean, that's something. So you should be laughing and having good times. Everyone having a good time? I'm I having can't see any of you. I just see myself and I think I'm having a good time. So, so I have a, um, I got this roller, rolling pin. It's an Indian one. It's working really good. I was noticing that. I used a one. You saw a small little rolling pin? Yeah, I like, those at H Mart. It was a dollar ninety nine. If you roll out little wrappers, if you would like a little guy, H Mart. Everybody on the everybody on here is in striking range of an H Mart. I think. I think so. I feel like H Marts are getting pretty ubiquitous. Yeah, yeah, I see. A, I hear a lot more of them everywhere than uh, Uwajimaya. I think. I wonder if Uwajimaya, because I know there's one in Seattle. Um, I'm not sure where else they have stores. If anyone else knows, I know there's not one in Denver. Usually when I think of an Asian market in the Denver metro area, I think of H Mart and the Palm, the Pacific Ocean Market. Yeah. And then I think, Annie, was it you that told me there's a little one in Boulder? You don't have to respond to that. No, sorry, we we're rolling more. <laughs> but yeah, there's a little one in Boulder. I guess there's a little one in um, Longmont too. So there's a couple around. But we, yes. we go to H Mart a lot because, yeah, or Palm. So if you're looking for a good book, Crying at H Mart is good. And oh gosh, so good. And, and will definitely make you want to go there. Yeah. And then the other thing too at H Mart, if you don't know about it already, they, they make um, kimbap, so like the Korean sushi, and then they have all the little panchan, the little side salads back in the prepared food section. So it's kind of like whole foods prepared section, but Korean stuff. And that's really great to have in the fridge and stuff. Um, the other thing too, is we make kitchari, which is an Indian uh, porridge rice kind of thing that's supposed to be really healthy for like, a lot of people do it like a kitchari fast. There's a recipe for that, for that on our website. And H Mart sells like big trays of dill and parsley and stuff to make kitchari with. So, cause you can never find dill. You, like you get those tiny little plastic containers at this grocery store, but they have like a huge tray of them. So I'd highly recommend the H Mart. I usually get a uh, kimbap from the H Mart when I do my grocery running for gyozas. Yeah, it's so easy yeah. just to grab it and then have have it in the car when I'm running errands. Yep. It's delish. Well, I have my gyoza folded, a couple of some random shapes. They're gonna be delicious. Um, if we're ready, I'm gonna start cooking. I'm getting my pan ready. I'm gonna turn on my heat. Let's hope it turns on. I'm sure we should light. I don't know if anyone has grown up. In, in household with a gas stove, and with a gas stove that where the flame goes out, we always used a chopstick, bamboo, oh no, 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 dang it, chopstick to be our lighter huh. to light our gas stove, because we always had bamboo chopsticks. <laughs> so you would find in my mom's um, kind of like utensil crock, lots of burnt, <laughs> Plastic or lots of burnt um, chopsticks, plastic. That's funny. So I got my, I have a non-stick pan. Um, for cooking gyoza, traditionally it's made in a cast iron, you know, well-seasoned cast iron. You can use a cast iron tonight if you trust it. Um, or non-stick. Um, this is a ceramic non-stick, which I really like. But any non-stick spray, I just would try to stray away from stainless steel. 
Um, because the gyozas are kind of like a pot sticker, they'll stick to the pot and you really, having not stick just one assures that they're not gonna get too stuck um, or a cast iron to make sure that it's well seasoned. I have made them in a stainless steel. The only thing that I would encourage is to make sure that when after the water, when you take off the lid, and you'll see this as we make them, that you really make sure that all the water's out and you're allowing just an, maybe an extra 30 seconds for those gyoza to crisp up at the bottom so that if you use a sharp or something with a really clean edge spatula, um, you're able to get it off, maybe kind of digging it underneath, but it should, should be okay. So I'm gonna put my heat. Hey Kelsey, one, on one, one second. Does anybody yeah. have to take a quick break to pee or move to the other part of their kitchen? Show of hands. Nope, okay, go. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna put it, it's on medium, it's not hot yet. I'm gonna add about a tablespoon or two of the cooking oil that I usually cook with, a neutral oil, neutral oil meaning I, a flavor, an oil with not too much strong flavor and with a decent um, cooking temperature. So either grapeseed oil or avocado oil, canola oil, vegetable oil. You can use olive oil. I usually don't use olive oil too much when I'm pan searing because it has one of a, or even in Asian cooking because it has a stronger flavor um, and not a really high cooking temperature. So I can feel my pan getting warm, so I'm going to add about a tablespoon or two to coat the bottom. Put that aside. I'm going to coat the bottom of this guy. Now since these are, this is fresh dough, it'll probably be about three or four minutes on each. We're gonna let that oil heat up because we want those gyoza to get good crisp on the bottom. You don't wanna put things in a cold pan or cold oil. So that's just about ready. And I kind of clean up my station. I'm gonna get my greens over here and get that ready, my plate. And once we put the gyoza in, we'll do the dipping sauce, which is, if you want to get that ready right now or get that those ingredients if you don't have them. Um, we have the rice vinegar, soy sauce, the sambal chili paste, and miso, and a little bit of vegetable oil. Wait, no. The miso and vegetable oil um, are for our salad dressing. So in the dipping sauce, it will be soy sauce, rice vinegar, a little bit of the sambal chili and then grated apple, and that will be the sweetness. So in my bowl right here, I've mixed it together. So you, and it's pretty sure it's about two tablespoons. I have the recipe. Yeah, about two tablespoons of soy sauce, a tablespoon of sesame seed oil, which I do need to add to this. To your, if you don't want it super spicy, um, I wouldn't add too much chili paste, maybe about a slight spoonful or have it on the side for if people don't want it. Um, and then some people do, so everyone can have an option to add it or not. Okay, I'm adding my gyoza to the pan. So should they sizzle? Yeah, you should hear a slight sizzle. They shouldn't be sizzling super loud, but I do hear a slight sizzle. And you should see some little bubbles at the bottom of it. I think a lot about cooking also is not just, you know, when you think about reading a recipe, a lot of cooking is also hearing, smelling, um, and tasting. So right now what I'm hearing is a little bit of sizzle. And that's usually actually one way when we get towards the end, you can tell that your gyoza are almost done. Um, it's one way in the markets I can hear, you know, with everything going on, I can hear, oh, that, you know, this pan's just about done. Once you hear that water start to evaporate, the sizzle turns different. So I have on medium, I hear sizzling. So we're gonna let this 
sizzle and crisp the bottoms until you see a golden brown on the bottom. And that's usually about three to two to three minutes, depending on how hot your pan is. Uh, my pan's taking, a, I can hear it cooking a little bit more. I hear the sizzle. So it should be sizzling a little bit more. You can go ahead and check. You wanna lift up a little gyoza butt and see if it's golden. Because once it's golden, what you'll do is add about a fourth a cup of water. Once the water goes in, you're gonna put a lid on it and then let it cook for about four to five minutes. Um, mine aren't there yet, so I'm just gonna wait for a second. But I can tell they're just about ready. Oh, that's so excited. We're getting to the best part. We can eat soon. Let me turn up my heat just a tad. Check in on my dipping sauce. My apple in there. I'm gonna give it a little taste. We like it a little bit sweeter. I know everyone's tastes are different. I think with dipping sauce, if you want it spicier, add more chili paste. If you want a little bit more of that vinegar, um, some rice vinegar, if you want it sweeter, you can add more grated apple or a little bit of agave, sugar, honey, to give it that sweetness. So I can hear, and I can almost see Okay, mine are just starting to get golden brown on the bottom and my lid. And I'm going to put about a fourth a cup of water and then I'm going to put my lid down so it might be a little loud. I'll put it down. <laughs> I'm going to turn down my heat just a tad. A hot water vapor. No joke. So we're going to let that cook for a while, um, probably about four to five minutes, like what I said, or until you start to see the water evaporate. The water right now is about a fourth of a cup. If your water is quickly evaporating, I would add more um, because you want that steam in allowing the filling to cook. And if your water is burning too quick, then I would turn down your temperature just a tad. And what you'll notice is your gyoza wrappers will slowly start to change from white, from that kind of white tan to a translucent. So those are gonna keep on, those are going. We're gonna switch to the dressing really quick because it takes a minute. So what we're gonna do is we have white miso paste. If you don't have miso, that's actually totally fine. You can still make this sauce. You could, instead of miso, something salty. You could put a little, so if you have anchovy paste or an anchovy, um, or you could even just use a little bit of Dijon mustard. I know that's not along the lines of Japanese, but it does make a good dressing vinegar. So I have about two tablespoons of miso or about a tablespoon. This miso, it's actually my best friend's miso and she made it. She took us experiment and fermented her own miso up in Seattle and blessed me with her miso and I'm almost out. And she also made a red miso. So I have miso. I'm gonna add about a tablespoon or so of honey or agave. Well, and I'm gonna add about two tablespoons of rice vinegar. I'm just gonna mix that. Sorry about that. Keeping an eye on my gyoza. Wrappers are slowly starting to turn. Now I can tell when the water is almost out, and there's, it, I can tell it's starting to get a little chalky from that cornstarch, um, and it's starting to bubble more, is when our gyoza are just about ready to have the lid come off. Um, probably only about 30 seconds left on that actually for this step. But I have 
rice vinegar, honey, miso. And then I'm going to add a little bit of sesame seed oil, about a teaspoon, just to give it a nice toast. If you have sesame seeds, you can add some sesame seeds. And then I'm going to slowly add and stir at the same time a little bit of that neutral oil. It could be grapeseed oil. This is when you could use an, an olive oil, but I'd probably use an avocado. Coconut, melted coconut oil, if you are okay with that coconut flavor. And that was about a fourth of a cup. I'm just gonna kind of whisk that a little bit more. And that is ready. Now my lid is coming off because I can tell that my water is just about evaporated. And from that, I'm gonna leave my heat because my pan's pretty hot, so I'm gonna leave it. So I'm gonna take the lid off and let the remaining water evaporate completely. Make sure I have my dipping sauce ready. Now you don't, you want all, I'm gonna make sure you want all the water evaporated. If your pan, you can tell, is starting to, you know, crisp in certain areas, you can just see oil, I'd still leave it just a tiny bit um, to make sure it can leave crisp and get nice and crispy on the bottom and then it also leaves the pan easier. And I can smell the curry. Ooh. Whoa. Pretty good. I'm told these are just about ready to crisp. I'm going to turn my heat up with a pad so I can get it done. It might spit a little bit. Oil and water, once it's starting to evaporate, will spit. So I just be careful for any flying oil. If you have an oil shield, this, this can work nicely, but I would make sure. For so these, I'm just going to make sure this, this part right here gets crisp. I'm going to Kelsey, what's the best way? That's why you're done. Put those last final edges. You turn off my heat. Grab my plate. Kelsey, question. Uh-oh. Now. You might have to be careful with it. There we go. You know, they say the pan is on stick. They say it is. I'm just gonna leave it for a second. There we go. There we go. Now, if you'd like to garnish it, if you'd like to be fancy, you can take a little bit of green onions, a little bit of sesame seeds. I'm gonna grab some chopsticks, have that ready. I have my green salad. I'm gonna drizzle a little bit of my vinaigrette on it. So it tastes a little bit. Oh. I love miso dressing. Give it a little toss. Give me a little bit of salad. All right. How's everyone doing? Can't hear anyone. Everybody, put your mics okay. on. <laughs> They're all muted. <laughs> that scared me for a second because I still can't see anyone. So I thought oh. I left the bill. I thought I'm unmuted. everyone left. Can you hear us now? Yes, I can hear you now. I just got a little worried. All right, so Kelsey, hold yours up. Hi. I'm going to grab. All right. Well, actually, every is everybody ready? 
No. Okay. Kelsey, I'm good. Like, hello. Whoa, that's beautiful. I'm gonna keep on trying to get the list off, please. Hmm? These look like they're from the dollar store. And <laughs> <laughs> after. Oh, I have to... my salad dressing ready. You mind me? You want to watch out? Watch out! Watch out! I need that. Like, I think it's like a quarter of olive oil. Mixing some olive oil. I'm gonna try to get that when it's done. Mine, of course. I'm sure it tastes good. It just looks a little off. Ready? Yeah. Oh no! <laughs> we had one of the fillings just explode out of the can. <laughs> Didn't seal that one, kind of. <laughs> yeah, that's why we seal with water because <laughs> sometimes fillings just pop out of nowhere and or if you find a leak then everything gets kind of crazy the oil gets all like sputtery and happy and it can a mess hey michelle did you make it on to cook or are you still in the car i'm yeah i'm not even home oh I'm no listening and watching you guys it's really fun this is my <laughs> show <laughs> yeah. i appreciate it I mean, I appreciate you had a good time watching. Yeah. Well, and I like the recording because we can go back and try it again. Very good. That and again. Yeah. <laughs> this also just shows that nobody's perfect. My heels are sticking. But I've noticed if your heels are sticking, if you just let them just chill out just for a second, just kind of give it a little bit of time, give it a little bit of space, because they stuck and they're being stubborn. Usually <laughs> after with a little bit of wiggle room, they pop off a little bit easier. If you just kind of give them a second to chill. The one thing I will say is that the Japanese curry has a lot of turmeric in it. So don't let it flatter and stay on your counters if you're worried about staining. Don't touch your clothes. If you had leakage like I did. From your from your gaze off. <laughs> Little leakage is normal. That's so good. Well, how are we ready to try them? Smell delicious, Kelsey. Smells so good. I think okay. we're gonna we're gonna try it. We might hang out for a bit while we try it, so you can see. How. Okay, everybody, hold yours up. I'll try to get a screen break. Something missed one. Mm -hmm. Try one. Oh, and everybody take your mics off so we can um, not have all a little red mic. Yeah, no. <laughs> so hold on, let me see if I can get everybody. Hey. Oh, it's hot. I don't have my salad yeah, ready. Hey. <laughs> oh, the cat joined. <laughs> okay. Everyone? Ready? Oh. Hold it up, eat it, whatever. <laughs> you can't say. Wait. No. Very good. Mm -hmm. Right. Eat the lucky mass. Cheers. Mm. We don't have any sugar. Oh, here. Get a bowl of soy sauce. Okay. 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 Hey Jennifer, my neighbor Jennifer and friend in our old building is on the on. I'll be making them and bringing them over to you. Mm. <laughs> mm. 
Hmm. How did everybody's come out? Very good. It the tastes good. good. They don't look good. good. Terrible. But they taste good. good. <laughs> I don't look good either. <laughs> but actually, they look, they look bad, but cute. So don't worry Let about it. Let me see. I did young. Cindy, could you take me off of a spotlight? Yes. So I can see everyone. I'll watch myself eat. Now? Good. Now I can see everyone. So does anybody have any questions before we wrap it up? So all of you should have the link to the shopping list and the recipes and everything. And then I'll send the list. Uh, I'll send a follow-up email with the uh, yeah. list. Yeah. Um, the recording link. Oh, I see. Just trying one. Mm. Well, I'm glad <clears throat> there's no questions, you know. Thank you guys for joining. Um, I haven't made, I haven't had a cooking class in a while um, and it feels good to be back cooking with people. Um, it's really, I've, I started doing little personal cooking classes in COVID, during COVID and uh, really enjoyed them because we get to, you know, I get to meet new people and we all get at the end to get a really yummy meal um, and get to share that. So I really thank you guys for coming um, and also supporting uh, Masi Masa and their delicious spice blends, these nice couple classes. If you are not signed up or if you are, um, they're really yummy or even just checking out and trying out their other spice blends. Um, they have great recipes on their website and uh, are delicious. So I wanted to say thank you if you're in the Portland area. I hope to see you at some farmer's markets. Um, we'll be at the Beaverton one coming up soon in February, and then we'll be at Oregon City and South Waterfront. And if you're in McMinnville, we'll be in McMinnville on Saturday at Mac Market from 11 to 2. So. And you don't have to make your own gyoza. Again, you don't have to make your own gyoza because I have already made all of them this week <laughs> so that you can have them frozen by the dozen. But I will say, Kelsey, I was intimidated to make gyoza and now I'm no longer into because the dough really intimidated me. And I really did not follow your directions or do it right and it still came out. So <laughs> kudos. That was good. Feel the same way. It, is <laughs> it was intimidating, but it's so delicious. Yeah, and it wasn't that I mean oh, I thought that's oh, I burned myself. <laughs> Hard. They're hot. You gotta be careful. <laughs> Hard to resist. I know. It's, it's sorry. I'm so sorry. It's so tempting to eat them right off of the pan, but they they get hot. So many so many times I've burned my mouth. So. Steam. <laughs> well, well, we won't okay. be at the markets until May, but I'll try to catch most of you elsewhere before that. So, thank you for joining us. And I hope you'll join us for the next three classes. The next one is going to be um, smashed potatoes with oh. bell chat, a mm -hmm. really fun Indian dish and an Indian take on smashed potatoes. It's gonna... really yummy. I'll be honest, when I took the picture for it and was, you know, trying out the recipe, I ate the whole plate after <laughs> it was. I mean, it looks beautiful because I love, oh, it's so, so I, it's delicious. I'm not going to say too much, but it's so good. Smashed potatoes are kind of one of those things that I wouldn't attempt. So it's, um, and then we're going to do shakshuka. Yes. And then uh, a Thai green curry stir fry. So with coconut rice. Mm. rice. Yeah. All delicious. <laughs> so I hope you can join. Yeah. Is there a question? Or... Question? Okay, sorry, I thought I saw a hand. So. All right, well, thank you, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. And two weeks. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.